production of Kansas City Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Smithfield Foods, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Coming up, dissecting this week's local election results, the fourth and final streetcar arrives, plus everyone seems fixated on the race for the White House, but what about those other big campaigns being waged in our region? Is anyone paying attention? And is royal success coming at a price? I'm Nick Haynes. Those stories and more straight ahead as we connect the dots on the local news of the week with pitch reporter Steve Vokrot from behind the microphone at 98.1 FM KMBZ Scott Parks, star reporter, columnist and blogger Dave Helling and the senior writer for The Call newspaper Eric Wesson. Now this week most parts of the metro went to the polls to vote in local elections. In Kansas City, Missouri, voters were deciding the earnings tax after what seemed like a year-long campaign by city and civic leaders to coax voters to renew the 1% tax. Voters overwhelmingly say yes. 77% in favor. Eric Wesson, any surprise in this result? No. Uh, it went according to plan. I think they put the information out there. People realize that it's in their best interest to do it uh, compared to other municipalities helping pay the tax rather than having them have to pay it on the backs of the taxpayers of Kansas City only. So I think it went according to plan. I think the, the big increase was the Northland was up a little bit. Uh, I think overall it was down one point. Uh, compared to where it was five years ago when they did the same uh, earnings tax renewal. I was listening to your show this week on KMBZ, Scott, and still plenty of people calling in with complaints about that earnings tax, belying the fact that only you know 23 percent of people voted no, but still a lot of people with concerns about that tax. Well, and, and one concern that I heard a lot, and I and I can't sympathize with it, came from people who live outside of yeah. Kansas City, Missouri, but work in the city, and they argue, well, we're being taxed without representation. Well, a sales tax in any city, technically, if you don't live in that city, would be a taxation w without representation. What we did learn uh, on Tuesday is that Kansas City, Missouri absolutely adores, at least those who vote, absolutely adores its earnings tax. And I think it's because they see it as a tax that other people pay, even though they do pay it. But think about the athletes that come into town, people who live in Johnson County but work downtown. And I think they like the idea that they're taking that money and using it inside Kansas City. Missouri. And the mayor and the city council rewarded the voters for saying yes to the earnings tax this week by increasing water rates by 3% and sewer rates by 13%. I thought that was interesting, the timing of that this week, Steve. Well, you're going to see a lot of things that have been uh, uh, simmering for a little while start to happen now that this earnings tax selection's got. Uh, is over with. They were a little bit jittery. Uh, it turns out that those, the nervousness wasn't really uh, founded, but I think now that this thing is done, look for big projects like streetcar expansion, look for projects like uh, airport overhaul. Uh, to really start to take shape now that uh, they don't have to worry about this election anymore. In a broader trend, Dave Helling, you know, I, I notice all over the metro, bond and tax elections in cities and in school districts passed at a time when we're told there is this anger and resentment and distrust about how government is spending our money. What does all this tell us? Well, uh, first let me just tell your viewers that on our new podcast called Deep Background, available on iTunes, we discuss this very issue because... Um, there's a sense somehow that Kansas Cityans are particularly anti-tax. The evidence suggests that isn't the case at all. That in, in time after time, if voters believe the tax is relatively low, that it pays for important services, that it's dedicated to a specific cause or purpose, and that they have a chance to come back and renew it if they want, Kansas Cityans, and I mean that in the broad metro sense, support tax increases over and over and over again. The exception, of course, was the uh, uh, health tax that came up uh, several months ago. And that's the exception, really, that proves the rule. This is a pro-tax community as long as voters believe that the tax is targeted, low, and renewable. Steve. Yeah, Dave's exactly right. I was going to make a similar point. As, which I thought is you were going to plug a new app or podcast that you had on the <laughs> pitch. deep I, background. Okay. I, I, I don't have any podcasts. Okay. Uh, but... Um, <laughs> No, Dave is right. It, you know, people 
there, there, there isn't that much groupthink in Kansas City. Um, people will look at the specific issue and decide whether it's good for them. And like the translational research tax, they voted it down overwhelmingly because they didn't really see what was in it for them. Over in Mission in Kansas, city council elections were being viewed as a referendum on the future of the Mission Gateway project. Steve, you write this week that the results couldn't have gone worse for the developer behind the project. Why and what does that mean for those decade-long plans to build something on top of the former Mission Mall? site? Well, the reason it couldn't have gone worse for him is because uh, one of his main supporters, who was an incumbent, lost her election. She was very effusive, Jennifer Cowdery was very effusive in her praise of uh, the project as it's proposed, which is a Walmart-anchored uh, uh, retail center. And the, her opponent got into the race specifically for that reason, it was because she opposed it and she won, which I think says a lot about where mission, uh, the mission's public's mind is on this project. And another, you know, two other critics of the project were elected. And this project needs as many votes as it can get because the developers are requesting roughly $30 million in incentives. And in mission, you have to pass that by a super majority. Um, I don't see that he has the votes unless he makes a drastic change to the plan. So this is going to be bad news for you, Scott, because your radio station is in mission, so you won't be able to watch out for falling prices at Walmart sometime soon. <laughs> no, but as somebody who lives three blocks from the uh, the Gateway Project and someone who does live in Roman Park, we're, we'll gladly keep Which our lost Walmart. its Walmart. Well, no, it still okay, has it's still it. there. Okay. Uh, we still have our Walmart so long as mission doesn't start the Gateway Project, and that's our biggest tax provider uh, revenue. Um, but as somebody who does live three blocks from it, let me tell you, I cannot figure out what they're going to do there, when they're going to do it. It is a scab on my neighborhood. It really is. It's a scab on the neighborhood. And you couldn't pick in Johnson County a better location. It's right at the intersection of Shawnee Mission Parkway and Johnson Drive. The amount of traffic that goes by that site every single day and how they, how the city and the developer can't come to terms with building something there in the last 10 years it just blows me away. Is there any plan B, Steve? Well, the, the developer, as far as I can tell, doesn't have a plan B. He owns the land, so okay. it's not like he has development rights. He owns it, so you know, if he wants to abandon it, it would be a matter of selling it. Um, bankruptcy is a possibility. Uh, he's in pretty big trouble. And, and the other possibility at some point, if the scab is not picked soon, is that the Mission City Council could condemn that property, take it and find a developer on their own. Now that would cost a lot of money and it, you would have to sort of negotiate with the developer to cover those costs, but they may run out of patience and when they do, maybe you'll get some movement. Let's stay with elections for a moment. We still don't know who is serving on the Kansas City, Missouri School Board three days after you voted. In fact, the results of that election won't be known until tax day, according to officials. Why, Eric Wesson? Because they have to go through, count each uh, ballot or each signature, make sure the name is spelled correctly, and then tally the votes from there. And it's a pretty lengthy process, and people are still concerned about none of the candidates going out, getting their required amount of signatures to be on the ballot, where they really that de dedicated. And I think uh, Brian Dow got the signatures, but some of the signatures weren't people that lived in that district, so they had to be deleted, and he wound up being a write-in candidate as well. Now, it's worth noting that while Missourians went to the polls last month to vote for their party's pick for president, the results of the, that election are also still not finalized. Yes, Hillary Clinton has claimed victory, and Bernie Sanders did concede on the Democratic side. But on the Republican side, frontrunner Donald Trump held a small lead over Texas Senator Ted Cruz after that March 15th vote. But the ultimate winner wouldn't be revealed until provisional and military ballots were counted. We're told that won't happen until tax day, which this year falls on April 18th. Why so long? And at this point, does it matter, Dave? Breaking news, by the way, the Secretary of State's office told me this week that they'll, they'll certify April 12th which is next Tuesday, not on the 18th. Uh, and it takes long, a long time because you do want to look at the overseas ballots, military battles, uh, ballots, and that type of thing. It's hugely important in the Republican presidential primary, uh, Nick, and here's why. It's about a half percent difference between Donald Trump and, and Ted Cruz, but the winner of the statewide vote in Missouri gets automatically 12 mm -hmm. convention delegates out of the 52 allocated to the state. That's a huge haul. If those ballots change the results, and Ted Cruz is the winner in Missouri and not Donald Trump, uh, Trump will lose 12 delegates, which at this point is a lot, 
and Cruz will gain 12 delegates. And so you'll go from a 37-15 Trump margin to a 27-25 Cruz margin in the state. That's a huge flip, important at this stage of the game, particularly if there's a contested convention. So we'll all be watching for those results. Well, most people are fixated, of course, on the race for the White House. What about all those other big races going on on both sides of state line? It may seem like small potatoes compared to the big job of commander in chief. But Kansas voters are picking this year a United States senator. So is Missouri, which is also picking a new governor. As we've talked so much about it, Missouri side issues, let's start in Kansas, where Kansas Senator Jerry Moran is up for re-election. Why don't we hear much about that? Well, I think part of it, like you said, is there's really this fixation on uh, on the presidential election. Um, I think, you know, frankly, the media, mostly the national media, has done, you know, failed in covering the presidential election because it's a very entertainment based because of Donald Trump's presence really sucking a lot of the oxygen out of uh, out of the you know some of the more important Senate and House races uh, I think you know if you're paying attention to local media you're seeing coverage of the Moran race and Moran has got some issues going on with the Republican Party um, over his initial position that you okay know, they well, let, let's let's get there okay, okay. let's get there because uh, this is a really important point because Senator Moran recently announced while in the state he would be willing to give Merrick Garland President Obama's new pick for Supreme Court a hearing then he reverses course and says no so you're left in no doubt he's now launched a new ad this week to make sure you know his position Senator Jerry Moran listens to Kansans. That's why Moran has fought to stop Merrick Garland from the moment he was nominated. Garland's liberal, anti-gun, big government views don't represent Kansas. Jerry Moran, 100% no on Garland. So it's quite a dramatic ad, a big change of position there. So was, he, was this all about him being fearing that he is going to get a challenger in the Republican primary if he didn't change his position? No, the, yes, and, and it's also all about Jerry Moran not knowing what he's talking about when he's in western Kansas and how his statements might play in other parts of the state and other parts of the country. Uh, because of those statements about the Supreme Court nominee, he, he ended up with the worst of both worlds. He made his right wing angry because he said he would hear from him, then flipped and made the left wing angry. Uh, you know, Jerry Moran is many things, but he is not a natural politician. The problem is, Nick, quickly is he has very little opposition. Does he doesn't he have, have a primary okay. opponent yet. Two Democrats have registered to run in the race, uh, but names that I don't recognize, and they certainly haven't reached out to us or others to talk about a formal campaign, until you actually have a race harder to cover. You know, and one of the things that you touched on that I think is very important is that there are 23 Senate races in the country, and everybody's focused <clears throat> on the presidential race. I guess that's the big prize. But when you really stop and look at the actions of Congress over the past seven years, the House and the Senate are the two most important because they ultimately run the government. And people are focused on presidential races and they're not looking at what those Senate races can do. Now, what about the Missouri side where Roy Blunt is running for re-election as United States Senate? Now, he's running against Jason Kander, the Democratic Secretary of State. Kander keeps blasting Blunt for not revealing who he'll support for the Republican nomination for president. Senator Blunt, who'd you uh, vote for in the Missouri primary? Should Senator Blunt have to disclose who he supports for the Republican nomination? And what difference would it make? I mean, we do have a secret ballot in this country, don't we, Steve? Uh, Scott? Yeah, yes, but what I think people are trying, what they're trying to do is, is get him to admit that he, he voted or supports Donald Trump. So and, what? Well, I, for, for a lot of people who consider themselves Republicans, myself included, uh, Donald Trump is a circus act. <laughs> and, and it would say no. something about Roy Blunt if, if he had supported Donald Trump. I don't know why it would, I mean, maybe he did, maybe he didn't. Quite frankly, I don't care. But it could be used against him, uh, certainly, if, 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 if he voted if, for if Trump. If he acknowledged that he voted for Donald Trump, does that mean he loses the election, Dave Helling? It, uh, it will be a problem. He believes it will be a problem, Roy Blunt. Uh, you know, Donald Trump is enormously unpopular in the state. However, there is polling that suggests that the blunt candor race will be judged a bit independently of the Trump Clinton race, if that's what we get at the top of the ticket. There was a poll I wrote on last week, a brief poll that showed uh, uh, Blunt up by double digits over Jason Kander, even though Hillary Clinton was beating Donald Trump in the state of Missouri. I did write a quick column, Nick, 
Uh, you know, uh, Jason Kander has his own problems in this regard because he will be tied to Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama by the Republican side. My own preference is that we drop all of this, that we let each candidate run his or her own race. That doesn't seem likely. It's going to be a nationalized race in the state of Missouri on both sides of the table. So what, what about the race then for governor in Missouri? Jay Nixon can't run again. State Attorney General Chris Costa looking to replace him as the Democratic nominee. He's being challenged by former Kansas City Mayor Charles B. Wheeler. And on the Republican side, what was once a humongous field of about 139 people has been slimmed down to four candidates. I'm the only candidate on this stage who has ever won a statewide election. I'm the only candidate on this stage and in this race who has the Missouri Right to Life Defender of Life Award on my wall. The state was embarrassed before the nation by the riots in Ferguson and the protests here at the University of Missouri. And while all that was happening, what did our state's chief law enforcement official, Chris Coster, do to defend this state? Nothing. Politicians have failed us and we can't trust them to fix the mess that they've created. I've never run for office before. I'm a Navy SEAL, an entrepreneur, and a concerned husband and father. You know, I'm the only one on this stage who has brought billions of dollars of business back to Missouri and created thousands of jobs. It's all about getting results and getting the job done. Okay, now we've talked about around this table, whether it be in the United States Senate race in Kansas or in the one in Missouri, that it's become almost a nationalization of those campaigns, that it's about Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Is this race also getting embroiled in that as well, Dave Helling? It might to some degree, uh, but it's the primary that we need to focus on a little bit in August. And the bigger dynamic in this race, Nick, is that you have four candidates who are roughly roughly equal in stature within the party and appeal to different constituencies within the Republican Party. Peter Kinder being the incumbent lieutenant governor a little bit ahead of the pack but not dramatically so. And so the chances of a brutal four-person well-financed uh, primary between the four of them is very high and whoever emerges will have to face a well-financed and undamaged Chris Coster which gives the Democrats hope in this state. Eric. And uh, there's another uh, Democrat, Bishop Eric Morrison. I think he's running on the Democratic ticket as well. He's just not getting the publicity uh, that Charles Wheeler and the others would get in a situation like that. Uh, it's going to be interesting to watch how that. No, no uh, one, but no one doubts that Chris Coster will be the oh, nominee absolutely. in the state of what, Missouri. Two million dollars with all the money anybody. he has and all the fundraising, and he don't will face count Charles B. Wheeler out. <laughs> yes, you Steve, don't count him out. Actually, I'm, you know, I'm pretty fascinated by Eric Greitens' candidacy. Um, there's a lot of GOP establishment figures in Missouri who seem pretty dazzled by him. I'm also kind of fascinated how he doesn't seem to really have much connection within the state. He seems almost more popular outside of Missouri. Um, than and within it and the financing he's getting, the checks he's getting for his campaign, a lot of it's coming from outside the state and it's pretty, I'll be pretty interested to see how he does in the uh, primary. Let, let, just quickly, Catherine Hanaway will have, or has had to date, Rex Singfield money, which is, as we know, unlimited. Uh, Eric Greitens, as Steve suggests, has been able to raise money outside. John Bruner is a millionaire, can self-fund, may spend yeah. six, eight million dollars on his race. And Peter Kinder is well known in the state, in every corner of the state, having been a fixture of GOP politics in Missouri for decades. You put those four things together, that's the recipe for a bloody primary, and I think we're going to get it. How many of these candidates, though, have an airport named after them in Kansas City? Oh, Charles B. Wheeler. Okay, all right, that's it. The fourth and final streetcar arrived in downtown Kansas City this week. Does that give the city enough time to have the whole system? up and running as promised for the big party on May 6th, Steve. As far as I know, I don't know that the arrival, the late arrival of the uh, fourth street car is going to have much bearing on whether it can open. I mean, if they've got the testing done, they can probably still open it in May. We, we did hear about the Mercedes with Johnson County plates, which the media seemed to love saying it was Johnson County plates, that had an altercation with the streetcar during a testing run last month, Scott Parks. But are we hearing more incidents, I mean, even among your, um, of your listeners on the radio, about problems with the streetcar and parking and where they need to park, and how do you even navigate around the streetcar? Not to my knowledge, although I did go downtown last weekend with my daughters just to see the track, and we were hoping to see one of the streetcars, but we did not. Um, I, I think the city's actually done a pretty decent job of, of trying to make people aware that, hey, this is coming. And uh, by the way, that little white line 
on the side of the street, you're supposed to park on this side of it. Um, and, and they're clearly marked. Um, and, and I've had a sea change personally regarding my feelings about the streetcar. Um, once I was opposed to, I, to borrow an old term from Emmanuel Cleaver, I thought it was touristy frou-frou at first. Um, but uh, I like the idea now, and if, especially if they can expand it and, and, and use it to, to bring in people who work in downtown Kansas City from Wyandotte County, Johnson County, and eastern Jackson County. Uh, I, I'd like the idea. Well, you're talking about expansion because there is a watchdog group suing um, uh, the, the, um, one of the main regional transit alliance groups here uh, to disclose information about the plans that they have in place to expand the route, even though the system is even up and running this week. Right. Citizens for Responsible Government, which uh, viewers of this show and readers of local press will uh, recognize, is, uh, they're, they're frequently at odds with what City Hall is trying to do. They caught wind that the KCRTA, which is a nonprofit, uh, which gets a lot of government funding, uh, appears to be trying to put forth a plan to expand the streetcar. They've shared some details with uh, groups like the Downtown Council and perhaps others, but have not made their plans widely known. Uh, so Citizens for Responsible Government is suing under the auspices of the Missouri Sunshine Law to compel them to release the information. I think it's something that has to be expanded. It makes really little sense to have something that's going that short a distance. I think they have to expand it. But, but when but there was a vote to expand it, voters said no. Well, I, and I think the voters said no because the supporters of it, I don't think that they presented a good platform for which to expand it. But I saw it the other day going through downtown, and I think one of the other problems are going to be elderly people who have some problems parallel parking might not make it over that white line. But I saw it the other day. It, look, it made Kansas City look like it was a big city. Seeing it going down there, the little bell was ringing, and, and but, it was, looked nice. But, but the problem is, if they don't expand it, then it is exactly what right. I said earlier. It is nothing but touristy frou-frou. And I think an, w without expansion, initially people like me and, and Dave and Steve and everybody will we'll, we'll ride it once or twice, maybe from Union Station up to the city market and back. But w without expansion, what purpose does it serve? Right. It, it has to be expanded, um, and it will come at incredible cost, no doubt. But it has to be expanded if it's to, if it's to be functional. We talked earlier about the Kansas City, Missouri School District. While it gets huge amounts of attention, it is nowhere close to being the biggest school district in our area. That distinction goes to the Olathe School District. This week, Olathe Superintendent Marlon Berry announces his resignation as he takes a job in Arkansas. By itself, this may not be a huge deal, but in the last couple of years, every major school district now in Johnson County has lost their superintendent. Blue Valley and Shawnee Mission both under new leadership. Natural attrition, coincidence, or is there another connection we can make for such a rapid turnaround of school leaders in Johnson County? Well, I think there is a connection. I do believe that school superintendents, not just in the Johnson County area, but across the state of Kansas, are growing increasingly frustrated with their inability to, to predict with some certainty how much money they'll have to operate their schools and to build new schools if needed and that type of thing, which of course goes straight back to Topeka, the state legislature, the governor's office and the Supreme Court, all of which are uh, still locked in a, a, a lengthy and difficult dance over how much schools will get from the state of Kansas. And I believe that, it, it, you know, most superintendents have concluded, Nick, that that battle isn't going to end anytime soon, that you'll get a Supreme Court decision on funding adequacy sometime in the fall. It'll go back to the legislature in 2017, go back to the courts in 2017. It may be 2018 or 2019 before we even get a remote semblance of peace in the school finance battles. And at that point, a lot of superintendents are saying, I can make a quarter of a million dollars a year somewhere else. Steve. There's been a real shift in the discussion about education in Kansas broadly, and it's occurred even uh, increasingly in Johnson County, where state lawmakers, even those that represent Johnson County, where schools have performed pretty well, have been successful at talking about how much school money schools get and couching the districts as places that get more money or enough money to do the job that they're doing and that the schools aren't spending it wisely. And I think for superintendents, they may see that as a hostile environment. Eric. And in addition to that, there's a thing that they get like every two weeks called a check. And once they get those checks and they get them $350,000 here, I think the tenure for, for superintendents is what, two or three years now? And they're making this money and that money is a draw. 
Uh, we've seen it in Kansas City School District with the last two superintendents, and this one will probably be the same way. He's a young guy. He's dynamic, great personality. He's got a plan on what will work. I guarantee you within about three or four years, he'll be out of here somewhere else with a million-dollar contract. All righty. The Royals have the biggest season opener ever this week. Sunday night's Mets Royals World Series rematch on ESPN captured the best TV rating for any Major League Baseball opener in any market in 15 years. Yet the success of the Royals is coming at a price. A new study finds Kauffman Stadium, now the eighth most expensive Major League Baseball stadium for fans. The website Go Banking Rates ranked all 30 stadiums by looking at the price of two tickets, two hot dogs, two beers and parking. And at Kauffman, that now sets you back $89.40. Is that because they're paying for a hefty payroll? It's also revealed this week that the once lowly underfunded Royals now rank in the top 15 for player payroll, Scott. Well, um, like everybody in this town, I loved what I saw last season and for that matter the season prior. Um, but success does come with a cost. Um, you, you either want great players. I mean, look, look what happens to Eric Hosmer when he goes to a Justin Bieber concert at the Sprint Center. He gets mobbed, literally mobbed on the way out the door. But um, for those of us who still love to go see the Royals, I do think there is a little bit of a longing, not for losing, but I can remember getting $5 tickets in yeah. the outfield <laughs> yeah. and uh, when I was younger. Not too many years uh, ago. Good luck with that anymore. <laughs> it's, those days are over. It's important to point out, and by the way, I did not get uh, mugged at the Bieber concert. I was able to come and go. And, and I actually didn't go. Um, but, uh, but it's important to point out, Nick, that the Kansas City Royals television deal yeah, in Kansas City yeah. is very poor. They don't get a lot of revenue from television. It was signed before they were good. And so that's one of the reasons you see the ticket prices and, and other prices escalate. I, and that's why we should be so happy to spend $89 for that, those things. Thank you very much. That is our Week in <laughs> Review. Thanks for joining us. I'm Nick Haynes. Good night.